Everybody, welcome back to the Beyond the Peloton podcast. After our long August layoff, I'm back from vacation. I'm I'm squeezing this in in between uh, podcasts with with my corporate overlords over at WeDo. I'm here as always with Andrew Vance from the Choose the Hard Way podcast. We are going to catch you up on the Volta Espana, the main storylines, maybe not as much tactical breakdown since we're um, 12 days into it and we haven't done a single podcast, but we'll talk about Sepkus's lead and how, if if possible, anyone can uh, can claw that back from him. Andrew, do you want to say a quick word about your podcast before we get into this? Choose the Hard Way is the podcast about how hard things build stronger humans who have more fun. Uh, come check us out. Find Choose the Hard Way everywhere you listen at choosethehardway.com, at Hardway Pod on social. Some of my recent guests from the world of cycling have been Gravel Pro is King, Drew Dillman, who's going after Dylan Johnson's uh, results in the Lifetime Grand Prix, trying to get into that game, Derek Teal. And this week I have team alpha male mixed martial arts professional fighter Vince Murdoch, who was on the cusp of getting into the UFC when he discovered he had a life-threatening illness disease called Moya Moya, ended up having a quarter of his skull removed to have emergency surgery. And as part of his comeback, he got really deeply into cycling and racing. In fact, Vince, I saw that you got on the California podium at a road race over the weekend. He's a really amazing dude. Uh, very inspiring stories. So please come check it out everywhere you listen. Choose the hard way. Andrew, 12 days in. The the 12th stage of the Velt is actually just inside the last 20 kilometers. I'm watching it as we record this. I'll call out any any notable things that happen. But we're 12, day, 12 days into it. Sepkus is leading by over a minute. I mean, we call, we called this. Who didn't see this coming? This Sepkus was was going to potentially win the Velt Espana. Um, the obvious pick from that stack, Yumbo Visma team. I'm joking, obviously. I didn't see this coming. Um, Primoz Roglic looks good. I'd say as good as I thought. Remco Evenepoel looks pretty good, but he still maybe can't climb high mountains as we saw on stage six. What do you think about this? Like, What are your big takeaways so far? The thing that's really jumping out to me are some of the new mega trends that we're seeing emerge in the course of this Vuelta, and I'm wondering if they're here to stay or not. And that, I mean, that's what I've found to be most interesting about this race, just to take it from the top, Sepp Kuss in the lead. I said, I think during the tour, hey, I I would like to have a shot at trying to win a grand tour one day. He also, I think four months earlier said, I have no interest in winning a grand tour. I really love my role and like, this is what I want to keep doing. Something, Something changed. There was a transformation in the course of the next couple of months. Now he's having a shot at it. But if we take a look at Sepp Kuss, I'm also thinking about Ghana. I want to talk about what's happening with him. And then some of these just bizarre, only at the Vuelta mass breakaways where you've got 20, 30, 40 riders. Yeah, it's front, crazy. Right? So yeah. these, are all, these are all areas where I would like to dig in. My primary thought that I have about Sepp Kuss and I, about Ghana as well, I'm wondering if this is a bit of the you let Rodman go to Vegas strategy. And if you've watched The Last Dance, you know what I'm talking about, where Rodman took off during the championship series and just went to Vegas without telling the team. Uh, And Phil Jackson was like, hey, this is what this guy's got to do. Is this just what they need to let Sepp Kuss do to keep him happy and on the team and not go somewhere else? Or is this just how the race is unfolding? What do you think, Spencer? <laughs> I love the analogy. It is. I mean, Sepp, we saw him on the podium chugging that that kava. The guy might <laughs> he might be up there with Rodman in terms of, of professional athletes who party. Um, I, I've heard the stories, and then I finally saw the chugging ability. So I, I was impressed, Sepp. Um, I don't know if it's as much as letting him as it's just kind of happened. And this is I think I mentioned it a few weeks ago in the podcast where you know, like Tyler Hamilton, Floyd Landis, all these guys leaving Postal. And, and, and maybe it wouldn't have worked out because Lance Armstrong never had problems. But man, you just hang around the hoop enough and you can find yourself in a position to win races. Think of Carlos Sastra at the 2008 tour. He is the Schleck brothers on his CSC team. Kind of a similar situation. Just the cards fall a certain way and you find yourself in the race lead in a position to win. And that on stage on stage six, where it was a total disaster. I don't know how quick step let a 40 rider move get clear. This is why you bring a really strong team with multiple GC options because Yumbo can say, well, we'll just put Sepp Kuss in there. And the more time it gains, the better it is for Sepp Kuss. The better it is Sepp Kuss, the better it is for us. The harder it is for Remco and Movistar. And it worked out perfectly. 
I, I think it's just kind of happened this way. I, I can't imagine this is a plan. And then once the, the, the thing about the lead is once he got through the time trial, there's not, you're not going to go to a guy that just put in a great time trial, has a minute right. and nine second lead and tell him, Hey, you got to lose this time. Or Primo's really wants to win. Can you let him win? It's going to be like, well, Primo's can, can try to beat me if he wants, but I like my chances because it's all mountains from here on in. And I'm a pretty good climber. Yeah. Are there no rules at the Vuelta and it's a race that's entirely different from all other races? Is it because it's at the end of a long season and it's, you know, whatever, it's like an anti-climax. The, the riders, the best riders in the world have been going after the classics. Then they wanted to win the tour, uh, world championships. Is this, this just kind of like throw your hands up, whatever. I think situation. it's because the teams aren't quite as strong. Like think of the sprinters, you know, we're on a sprint stage right now. Like Caden Groves was a negative 186 favorite yeah. to win the stage. That's like Pete Cavendish odds. And he's not one of the world's best sprinters, but there's just no top sprinters here. It's the same way with the domestique where Quickstep, Movistar, Ineos don't have their strongest teams here. So Yumbo is the only really, really, really strong team. So if 40 riders go, who's going to pull that back? You know, it's kind of, um, it's like the same thing where, you know, if everyone in a prison wants to break out of a prison, they can't really be stopped. Like if everyone in the Peloton realizes that, Hey, we can go in the breakaway. Well, no one can really stop you. So I think it is a little bit of a mentality where people know they can get in big breakaways and they know that there's not the strength to stop them. And there's just not the raw strength to stop them. If this was the tour, Bora would have their whole team on the front nailing back that breakaway because Einar Rubio could challenge their 15th place and they really want that 15th place. So the fact that the lower placings mean less means that you can have these big moves. Like we saw Garrett Thomas, your your guy was out of the GC, really out of it, got like five and a half minutes back yesterday because he got into a breakaway. He's still like 18th place, seven minutes back from the lead, but right. that's a lot of time to make up and I don't think he's getting in that breakaway at the tour. Yeah, that was a, I want to talk about that breakaway. Again, you had the bizarre, very large group breakaway. You had many strong riders in the break. And then you had Ghana. I really want to talk about <laughs> where in the world is Filippo Ghana and what will he become? I also want to talk about Remco's comments about Ghana on the Lantern Rouge, Rouge podcast. Um, but yeah, in that break, Ghana doing tons of work to try to get Garen Thomas in position for the win. And then everyone in the break is like, great. <laughs> let's, yeah, let's this let, is awesome. Let's let, this is awesome. Wow. Like they're really driving the break. This is going to stick. And Ghana's exhausted by the end, end of the race. They know Thomas doesn't really have the punch to pull it off. And then bam, knockout. And. The craziest thing is I think Ghana could have won that stage. If Ghana attacks, if Ghana is not right. setting pace and Ghana attacks, who is pulling him back on that climb? And even maybe Jesus Harada was too strong to beat in that sprint. That guy was really strong in that sprint finish. But if Ghana is putting out Ghana Watts on that gradient, I don't know. He might. I think he was their best chance to win the stage. It just speaks to the... I've been doing actually a little bit of research into this. And that there's not as much like heavy handedness in the teams, maybe as there used to be in the sport or as you would expect. So in our minds, Dave Brailsford has like screens upon screens in front of him the night before the stage and his crunching numbers. What's our best way to win this stage? All right, Filippo Ghana, we're going to execute that. It sounds like a lot of this is just rider led decisions. So Ghana said, apparently, allegedly to Thomas, like, I can't win the stage. I'm just going to work for you. And that was as, as much as thought as they put into it and it kind of showed because there was once Ghana was setting pace it's like well this is impressive but Garrett Thomas isn't winning out of the sprint Garrett Thomas's best chance is to be alone and you not to be setting a hard pace and then for you to attack once he's caught in Ghana like does Ghana have dysmorphia rider dysmorphia I mean we saw in stage what was that stage four where stage five maybe where he almost he got second almost won the sprint the guy is incredible. So he almost wins that sprint, wins a time trial, probably could have win one yesterday's stage. And he's still just kind of like, no, I'm too heavy. I can't win uphill stages. Oh, no, I just have to work for Garrett Thomas. It's like, well, Garrett Thomas is in 18th place in the GC. Maybe we uh, pivot to the Ghana show a little bit. I think he doesn't quite realize how good he is and how versatile he is because 
I honestly think he was Ineos' best chance to win yesterday, and he's just totally misused in his role. Yeah, completely. And I'd like to triangulate a couple of high credibility data points, I mean, that are coming from primary sources. So Garen Thomas has had Ghana on his podcast a couple of times. The first time he had him on, they did a really deep dive on the hour record and then on Ghana's performance during the tour and his his climbing ability. So he specifically talked about his transformation that's happening, which again, I'm not quite like we see the force. I'm not sure we see the direction in this vector yet because we've now seen in the past six weeks, we've seen Ghana seemingly trying to contest bunch sprints and he seems to probably have the horsepower, but he doesn't have the positioning to be in the right place at the right time and probably doesn't have the propensity to take the risks that you need to take to actually execute in a bunch sprint. Could he learn that over time? Maybe, I know you and I have talked about that's kind of a binary. You either have that, I'm gonna shut the door on somebody or not kind of killer instinct when it comes to bunch sprinting at that level. So like, could he learn that? I don't know, maybe. Does he have the engine to do it? It seems like it. When it comes to time trialing, it was interesting when Remco was doing his hearts and minds benevolent Remco appearance on the Lantern Rouge podcast, which was an interesting listen. He had a lot of nice things to say about Ghana, and he also was talking about himself. And he said part of why he has had such definitive authoritative wins time trialing is because he's really worked, it seems, on his shoulder mobility specifically and you know, the impact that that has on his CDA, I guess, is significant. And he was analyzing Ghana's time trial position because Benji and Patrick were asking, could Ghana, is there some way that Ghana can beat you? Because you seem unbeatable at the moment. Ghana has to be near the peak of his physical ability from a watts per kilo point of view. So then it's a question of, can he lower his CDA? And damn, man, he looks quite arrow to me. <laughs> when I see yeah. him ride He's a bicycle. the second most aero guy in the peloton, I would say. Yeah. PT bike, yeah. And, you know, Remco's feedback was, well, you know, when I was trying to go even faster in time trialing, what I, I, I did like some mobility exercises for two months and then I got way faster. And I, I'm not recalling off the top of my head their ages, but they're at least four or five years apart, right? Like Ghana's like 27, 28, Remco's... Rimko is 23. Ghana yeah. is 27. So four okay. years. Four years apart. But you know what? It's it's definitely easier to get more mobile when you're 23 than it is when you're 27 with the wear and tear that Ghana has on his body from being a professional athlete that much longer. And he definitely started earlier than Remco, right? So can Ghana do something from a, a narrowing his torso point of view, which is really what we're talking about when it comes to like rolling your shoulders in that also constricts your breathing. I don't know. So maybe he's decided kind of my reign as the world's best time trialist is over. There are people who just physically are shaped in a different way that can, who have an engine that's on par with my engine. They can't go faster. Now the question is what, who do I become as a rider or Maybe he's kind of bored of kicking one of everyone's ass in time trialing. He had the hour record, right? So it's, does he go in the sprint direction? Going back to this breakaway with Thomas, I agree with you. His climbing performances seem similar to his attempts at sprinting, where it seems like he has the engine. And again, when he was on Garen Thomas's podcast, he talked about how he doesn't enjoy climbing. He finds the workouts to be extremely difficult, but he's put a lot of time into getting better at it. So he probably has the ability. Maybe he doesn't have the belief. And also, you know, maybe this is um, just him wanting to do something nice for Garen Thomas as he's on the way out the door, because we know that we're getting to a point where it's highly unlikely that Thomas is going to be on top of the podium again. Yeah, so I think my, it, that's that's my analysis of what's going on with Ghana. With like, what do you think, Spencer? Well, I think the big question we should ask about Ghana is: Should he do all of that to become a faster time trialist? Because what is the li the life of the world's best time trialist? To me, is kind of an odd one. It's like, okay, you're amazing at this this one discipline. So let's say you win a world championships, like Remco did. That's pretty cool. 
maybe you can win a, a grand tour stage when your team is in a, in a pinch like Ghana did. That's pretty cool. But you don't have there, these guys do not last for very long at the top. If you go back through like the world's best time trial list, you have like three or four years. And I think they mentally just burn out because that's what you're describing. Like the quest to always be the most arrow and it's, and often they're so good and talented. Like Tony Martin found a whole nother career after he was a time trialist. And yeah. it was probably a much nicer life. And Ghana could be contesting stages like yesterday. He could be contesting one day races and he could just get out of the time trial game. Being so focused on those time trials, I think like Marlon or Marion Rusler, I, f- I forget her first name, uh, the Swiss time trialist at World Championship just sat down on the side of the road because she was so emotionally exhausted from the event. Yeah, I think these are just hard events on people. I, I would just get out of the time. Tra- if I was a time trialist like Mateo Sobrero, I'd be trying to get out of the time trial game as quickly as possible and get into the stage hunting game. Like Leonard Kamna, fantastic time trialist, will yeah. never win a time trial because he's just found something else to do. And even with Remco, I think if he really wants to start winning serious Grand Tours against good competition, he's going to decrease. He's not going to be as good at these standalone time trials. Like If he wants to try to win the Tour de France next year, he will not be winning the World Championships in the time trial because it just makes you slower. You focus on other things. You're not as focused on folding your body in on itself. And those one-hour efforts, you're focused on maybe performing well in mountain stages that have more than one HC climb, which he's never done before. So I think Ghana, it's time, it's time to move on. I mean, he he kicked everyone's butt for a few years. It was cool to watch him do like 57 kilometer per hour time trials, but it's now Remco's time. Let it go. And let's see some, let's see what he can do. I think he could win one week stage races. Maybe he doesn't want to do that. As you said, with the climbing, that's pretty boring, but man, he had a good spring. He didn't get any, Big, big wins, but he could have won San Remo. He had right. a shot at Roubaix. So I would rather see Ghana do that and then maybe believe in himself a little bit more in these. Maybe try to get more freedom from Ineos because realistically, they're not winning any major grand tours with their current lineup. So unless they make uh, big changes, well, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later in the podcast. But right now, like, what, what are your thoughts on Remco? To me, kind of a funny race i can understand the uh like the outrage after stage one because he did race in the pitch black that was insane um stage three he just runs into someone because i guess they have the team helpers too close to the finish line that was not fantastic i could understand being mad about that but then stage eight you know he puts in a great performance in that climb i calculated him at about like 510 watts for eight minutes of that, the last eight minutes of that climb, pretty good for a guy that weighs like 61 kilos. Um, That's unbelievable. And then just kind of leads over the climb, leads out Primoz for the sprint, claims he didn't know they were going for the win. Uh, That was bizarre to me. Like why? And then said it was easy to sit in Primoz's wheel. Stage nine, another thing where he, I, he kind of got dropped by Primoz when Primoz attacked. So it's like, was that easy the day before? And then Yesterday, not attacking on a climb that I think suits him more than Sepp Kuss and then saying, well, it's not on us to make the race hard. It's like, well, isn't it literally on you to make the race hard? Because don't you have to drop Sepp, Sepp Kuss? Like, like, what is going on here? Is this just chaos inside the team? And then they have one of their team helpers going as hard as he can in the time trial to get like sixth place. It's like, well, what is going on there? Don't you want to save your team for the race? Like, feels like chaos inside that quick step team and when he said he didn't know he was racing for the stage win he just blamed his team said they screwed up didn't tell me i don't know if i've ever seen a like a top gc rider just throw their team under the bus like that yeah it's it's bizarre and going back to the two-hour interview we did on the lantern rouge podcast which i know we've talked about this but clearly it's like a hearts and minds pr effort he wanted to reposition himself you get this sense that he has some self-awareness or the people around him were had the sense of we need to shift Remco's public image. He showed up on that podcast, was like very gracious to his teammates, to his competitors. I didn't hear him say anything moderately controversial about anyone. And then the guy who shows up at the race just is the person who people seem to strongly dislike. Uh, as a competitor, like, you know, you just kind of highlighted all these different instances where, you know, we're not, we're not getting that up close and personal look that I think would help dimensionalize the event, 
make it more exciting and take us inside what's actually happening a bit more. Some of it's understandable that team time trial was absurd. And to me, again, underscores the fact that we need to remove team time trials from professional <laughs> cycling. I, like, don't know if, I don't know if I can connect those two dots, but I do agree with you. We, we've ended up in the same place. I do think they need to get rid of those. They, they got to get rid of them. And yeah, I mean, he was outraged and expressed himself in a manner that made sense and didn't seem entirely professional. He just, he seemed very rattled by everything and has come across as extremely emotionally immature, which makes you doubt his ability to lead a team and to actually win the race again. And definitely it's like, can this guy really win the Tour de France? I have very serious doubts about does, that based on the way he's showing up right now. Made it look like that so far. I mean, with the, it just feels like it's all coming at him very fast. Like Josh Allen, very good quarterback now, but like in his first two years in the league for the Buffalo Bills, like his eyes would be so big in his helmet and it just looked like the game was coming at him so fast. And that's kind of how I feel about Rimco here. We're just like stage three, he wins this great win, posts up like Lanch and Rouge told him to. And then he just rides straight into somebody. It's like it was so there, weird. there may be people at the finish line of a race. You've done this before. And yeah, it, it hits his head really hard. It just felt like, have you been to a bike race before? This is a little funny. And then this talk of like, oh, he's the he's the patron of the Peloton. It's like the man's never raced the Tour de France. I don't know how much respect he's commanding from inside the Peloton. Uh, maybe show up to the world's biggest race. And then you can talk about how you're the best GC rider in the world. But I think a lot of this goes, I think, if, think about all the weirdness with his dad slash agent making it public that he wanted a bigger contract. He wanted to get paid like Tade Pogacar in the months leading up to the tour, we might start, we might be seeing why they were so eager to sign a new deal before the start of this race. Because what if yeah. what, it's looking like, I know stage six, I know he said he had a bad day. I don't think he did. If you go back and watch that, it just was a hard day of all out racing. They hit a long, hard climb. And it just, he does what Remco does on those where he rides his own pace and he lost 30 ish seconds, but he didn't, his pedal stroke looked fine. He didn't look like he fell apart. It just, he loses little chunks of time like that on high mountains. It's kind of like a Bradley Wiggins esque GC ride. So assuming that he's not going to be faster than Roglic and Sepp on in the high Pyrenees stages 13, 14, probably loses a little bit more time, probably doesn't win this race. He finishes third, fourth. I mean, think what is his value? It's not, it's not equal with Pagachar. And then what if he goes to the tour next year and, and really doesn't do well? You know, then his current deal starts to look really good. So I think that's why you were seeing so much eagerness from them to get a new deal in place before the start of the race. Yeah, it makes sense because it is possible that he enters this race as a Galactico and exits as a Craftico. <laughs> Watch him win the race. Watch him win the race. Yeah, now. <laughs> totally. Yeah, he's totally going to win. I mean, like, let's not rule that out. A lot of a lot of things could happen here. And I mean, let's, so let's, maybe let's jump over to Sepp Kuz. Can Sepp Kuz win this race is one question. I think a, a different question that's perhaps orthogonal, but we should consider is what happens if Sepp Kuz shows up at Leadville and goes toe to toe with Keegan Swenson in 2024. <laughs> what if what if he makes a gravel pivot? Because there's Doesn't been so much. There's his, this. <laughs> Doesn't defend his Vuelta yeah. title. <laughs> yeah, decides to walk away from World Tour road racing. Has had it with. Uh, he's he's fully integrated into European living, and is like, you know what? I'm going back to Durango. I'm all in on dirt. This thing's taken off. I'm going to catch the wave while it's here. Is Keegan from Durango? No, Keegan, Keegan is from, Keegan is from Utah. He grew up in Utah. I think he grew up in Park City. Or okay, okay. Near there. So they're yeah. both high altitude kids. The thing about yeah. this is ridiculous. Let's cover Leadville first, then we'll get to the Volta. <laughs> um, let's just put this to bed. So Keegan Swenson, very good rider, best gravel rider in the world. Wins Leadville record time. Is, uh, hold on, though. Is I no disrespect to Keegan. He's an amazing rider. Is he the best gravel rider in the world? Compared to all like, you know, Nikki Terpstra, all these other gravel pros that are now on the UCI circuit in Europe. Uh, Matthew, Matt, Matthew Vanderpool, we know, is well, racing the gravel world championships. 
at that I, that is a good question no he's not he's gonna get crushed by those guys i hate to say it i mean I, he's someone not was, gonna, he's not gonna go i don't think but he's not going i don't, I don't know saying? i don't i don't think he is I mean, the reality of this is a listener reached out and asked me about this. The reality is Wout Van Aert's FTP, probably 100 watts higher than Keegan Swenson. So on like a, a basically a road race in the Veneto on gravel, I mean, it's not even going to be close. Like he just doesn't have the engine to stay with those guys. But the thing is that these high altitude mountainous gravel races, I mean, he's the best. Like I don't think Wout Van Aert isn't training specifically for that. You know, maybe he would, maybe he would win Leadville 100, but maybe Keegan could take him on that course with the preparation he has. So in that respect, he's definitely the best guy showing up to these races, but he like, like his normalized power was about, I think it was like, I saw like 300 Watts for five and a half hours for that Leadville race. That's very good at altitude. Let's adjust that. Let's just say 350 normalized for five and a half hours. If that was at sea level. That's like what guys are doing in the Gruppetto at these races. So I don't think that automatically makes him like the best road racer in the world. And then he's five kilos heavier than Sepp Kuss. Sepp Kuss would be doing the same power that Keegan Swinson is at Leadville, but just five kilos lighter. And he would be dropping him and crushing him on, on the climb. So I, I think, I think Sepp could take Keegan with all, all due respect at Leadville next year. But can he win this Vuelta Espana? I mean, yeah, yes, would be the obvious answer. Will he? Uh, slightly more complicated question, maybe. But I, I know for a fact that teams are panicking, um, regretting the stage six debacle where they let him get into a 40 rider move, take so much time. I think there was an expectation that he would lose that whole advantage in the time trial. He did not put in a very good time trial to, uh, I think he only finished like a minute 20 back on Remco, um, which is really impressive when you consider that GC guys like, Juan Ayuso did about did about uh, the same performance. I, it's not obvious to me where they take it back. I mean, you can't say Evanipol should be penciling in maybe slight losses to Sep. Uh, stages thirteen and fourteen in the Pyrenees are really hard, like the hardest stages that Remco has ever raced. You would say, I would say for sure that Primoz Roglic, strongest climber in this race on every climbing stage, has shown that. So he'll probably take time. I I just don't see where. Sepp is going to come back unless he totally falls apart because it's his three, third grand tour of the year. Do you feel like the Vuelta is the stage race of the accidental winner? It definitely seems to happen more than other stage races, but let me pull up the, uh, let me, let me, let's fact. I mean, I, race, I say but, that, I say that yet yeah, Primos, he's a champion, you know, no longer, four. yeah, no right. longer a Galactico, but he's bona fide. He's legit. He's credentialed. Remco, you know, he swung for the fences. He connected. And then this year, it's feeling a bit... It's, to me, this is feeling a bit more like certain editions of the Giro where you get a winner, a Jaya Henley, for example. Great rider, but a bit of a surprise! Yes, yeah. Well, this kind of reminds me of like 2015 where Tom Dumoulin was leading and then Fabio Aru won. Um, but, but that would maybe be disrespectful to Sepp Kuss. and even Jai Hindley, great, great, great writer. Yeah, absolutely. Kuss, you would probably say one of the three best climbers in the world. Absolutely. I mean, Jonas, Jonas, when fit is better. Tade, maybe, you know, I, it, when, I, and that's the thing about the unbig unknown here. We rarely see Sepp Kuss race. Normally he's pulling off with the K to go because he's trying to save his energy for the next stages so he can help his team. We don't even really know what he's capable of. From, but from what we've seen, great climber. It, to me, it would be more of a return to the olden days of like where pure climbers who are not time trial specialists could win Grand Tours because that doesn't really happen in the more, anymore. You think about Evanipol, you think about Roglic, you think about Pogacar, Vindigo. Those guys are all time trialists. Um, Jai Henley, as you said, would be one of the only climbers that has won. And, uh, Jai Henley and Carapaz. I mean, Teo Gegenhart was a great time trialist the year he won the Giro. Um, these guys rarely win anymore. And the thing that the question I have about the three grand tours, I'm answering my own hypothetical. Go for are it. We, are we sure this is bad? It's not like he was trying to win the Vuelta or the Giro in the tour. He just did them. Is that not maybe that's good training? Like, I don't I don't know if we really have the data on this. People are just throwing it out there as an automatic negative, but you know, he's had a light race schedule outside of those races. Maybe those act 
as good training camps, essentially, for the Vuelta. Um, I don't think we have a ton of data on it, but I guess we'll see. I, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's an automatic negative, like most people are assuming. Yeah, definitely. And it was very interesting to read Sepp's comments following the time trial. And this completely makes sense. He had never been in a position in a time trial where he actually went as deep as he possibly could because his job was to finish within the time cut and be as fresh as possible to do his job as a climbing domestique or whatever or whatever else needed to happen within the race to support his teammates. So this is one of the first times in competition in a grand tour when he's gone all out in a time trial and what he's discovered is he's quite good. He's not going to beat Remco, but the margin of time between them was not as massive as we anticipated it might be, or at least I anticipated it might be. And I guess it stands, he did not look good on the TT bike. We should say that he looked very <laughs> shockingly on arrow, but you know, even at his weight, like 61 kgs, he's still a tall guy. So he's, he's not an incredibly, he's not absurdly lightweight, like uh Naira Quintana or something. He must be putting yeah. out huge watts on these to put in these climbing performances. So if he can get decently arrow, that's you know not the worst combination for a time trial. Yeah. So I, I think the question will become if Sep wins this race, what is his trajectory from here? What is the teleology of his career from here on out? Does he then want to pursue? I don't know. Does he think, gosh, I need to go somewhere else and try to win the tour? Oh, he, I mean, and he, I hope not. right, but I, I, he knows better than anyone else the ins and outs of how Jonas ticks. What does he do? I mean, what could you flip What do you that do, Jack? Say, what do you do? He, know, <laughs> he knows the ins and outs of Jonas and knows that no one is beating Jonas in top form at the tour. To me, this, this is the downside of Sepkus winning this race is like the next five years where he's chasing we've seen this before like chasing that it's tj syndrome yeah yeah he's in the tj zone what'd you call that like the tj zone of delusion or something at the no tour? that's just tj great guy he gave it his all going after winning the tour was probably not the best move for him so we'll just call it the tj syndrome i mean i think i i like sep Kusa's career like i think this was working well for him if he wins this race that's fantastic I would say the most aggressive I would get is trying to win this Euro, which I think he could do. The tour, I just feel like that's a trap. It's a huge trap for these guys that he does not have the time trialing ability to match Jonas and Tade. You know, maybe, maybe he could beat Tade. Maybe. I don't know. I just don't see it. I think Yumbo's a good setup for him. And it's why it's getting a little crowded at Yumbo. Um we're it's actually a little yeah, it's getting a little crowded over there. You also have to wonder at this point. Primos doesn't win this race. And I, something that's definitely on my mind is Primos is tied for the most victories at the Vuelta. He's, so he's tied for the record. Wait, I think of, winning would tie him. I think he's tied. Didn't Haras win four? I think Haras. Hold on a second. All right. Uh, let's, let's just assume he's tied. Oh, it's loading. Oh, also Milano. Oh, one he Sebastian did. Malone okay. Won he won stage. four times. All right. Roberto won four so times. So this would All tie right. him. This would tie him. There's, it's really interesting. Uh, we have the Guinness Book of World Records. The page on cycling, the way it phrases Primos's Vuelta wins and Cavendish's Tour de France stage wins, it's phrased in such a way that it makes it sound like they are the holders <laughs> of the world record when, in fact, Cavendish is tied and Primos is second most. I know this because my son came to me and said, Hey dad, Mark Cavendish has the most stage wins at the tour in the history of the race. I said, you know that he's tied with Eddie yeah. Marks. And he's like, he's like, he was adamant. He's like, no, he's not. It says it right here. <laughs> and I read it and I was like, yeah, the way this is phrased is kind of ambiguous anyway. So I'm getting my information from bad sources, the Guinness book of world records. So I apologize. I'm walking it back, but you still have to think Primos wants to at least Ty Haras, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, Ty, I guess that's that's just a bonus. I'm sure he just wants to win the race. The guy loves yeah. winning. To win a second grand, two grand tours in the same season. Not many riders have done that. I should have the data right in front of me. Um, I'll just say it's rare. It doesn't happen very often. You got to be really good to do that. It would kind of 
get him back in the conversation of top GC contenders. But realistically, I mean, and, and this probably has motivated him. He's 33 years old. He doesn't have that much long left winning these grand tours. He has maybe right one more year, two more at the most. So this is important for him. I, it does put Yumbo in a little bit of a tough spot where how do they beat Remco? Well, they make the race as hard as possible, just like stage six. Like he does not climb well with kilojoules in the legs before a climb. So you'd make the race as hard as possible using Sepp Goose, ideally, to blow him up on stages 13 and 14, which are hard, which are like Tour de France level um, high mountain stages. Oddly, they are in France um, in the Pyrenees. And then drop him and Primoz wins. Yay, yay, yay. The issue is. Sepp Kuss, not going to be doing that work because he's the race leader and he's clearly interested in holding on to this race lead. And Yumbo, I guess, is incentivized not to make the race hard because shouldn't the other teams make the race hard because if the race isn't hard, Sepp Kuss wins the race. What happens, though, if the race is easy, like we saw Quick Step blocking the road yesterday, which I still cannot believe happened. Um, maybe you guys should try to take time back because you need time. If let's just say that happens, but then Sepp Kuss has a bad moment in the third week, loses time, but then Yumbo hasn't taken advantage of making the race hard for Evanapol, and Evanapol wins the race. It's kind of the the perfect avenue for Remco to win if Yumbo doesn't take this up, keeps it easy. Sepp cracks, Remco wins. You know that's the, where this gets slightly sticky. Other than that, though, not a terrible position for Primos because. Let's say Jonas Vindigo attacks on a climb. The guy's two two twenty two down. He might be attacking on some of these climbs. Remco chases who's right on his wheel, Primus Roglic. That's not a bad place to be for him. So it's not like this is terrible. And I think if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. You know, if if uh, the race gets really hard, I think Roglic probably wins because he's he's the better climber. He's fresh. He prepared specifically for this. But Sepp Kuss, I, w- I would say he's probably the second most likely to win in, in my made-up little algorithm. Primo's is the, <laughs> is the most likely. Um, and then you probably, I, I kind of don't think the book is written on Jonas. I think everyone's kind of writing him off because he's not dazzling the way he was at the tour, but he's only just over a minute behind Remco Evenepoel. Not a terrible place to be with your uh, preferred terrain coming up. Yeah, and Primo's has already had his roundabout crash he for got the out race. Of the way. So, yeah, done. maybe he's maybe he's gotten it out of the ray way. He seems okay. You know that he wants to flex that telemark on top of the GC podium at the end of this race. Oh yeah. He wants he right? Wants, he wants to. Um he, I think did you did you have information that he's leaving the team? Or is that just you thought he should leave the team after this year because he won't be able to ever lead the team I, at the tour? That's just wild speculation. But as I'm reading the tea leaves here, okay, let's say Primos doesn't win this race. Sepp wins. Then Sepp's going to, he's going to want to probably win the Giro next year, I'm guessing, depending on how spring goes. If he stays injury free, is the team going to support him? Jonas wants to keep Sepp happy because he doesn't want Sepp to go to another team. And even if he's locked in, we all know contracts in Europe and contract law are different and they a writer it favors labor writers can pretty much get out of anything if you have another team with sufficient funds and we know that there are some teams out there and some things happening and some big checks about to get written in the next couple of weeks that we'll be hearing about later in the year so i just wonder does is primos going to be content with going down that quickkowski path which is where i see him going after this race if he does not win he, I think he becomes a full-on support writer. Is he happy with that? Or does he want to, I don't know, does he go to a French team next year? Oh, does he get, does somebody buy out his contract? We see him go to IGTR. Like what happens? Man. I mean, I guess he still has the one weeks. I still think he has a few years of uh, winning one week stage races. I'd like to see him be a little more active in one days, like hilly one days. Yeah, sure. But, but I mean, is is Yumbo going to keep him around, pay him that salary for him to like become the next Richie Port, basically? Uh, they, I'm sure they would love to if he wanted to do that. It's hard to yeah. know. I mean, he's a very tough guy to read. The question he is, is, if you, he is tough to if read. You leave yeah. Yumbo, where are you going? You know, there's not a lot of good options out there. Like you're not going to so Mogus. To UAE. What is? What if he goes to UAE? That would be hilarious. He was could happen. Tade's main man at UAE. 
That team is that team is not well run though. I mean, it's complete chaos. Like you can see, like seem like they're having fun. They're having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Solaire, by the way, we we haven't mentioned this. Mark Solaire is second in the race, in this race, twenty six seconds back. Joao Almeida is sixth, two sixteen back. Juan Ayuso eighth, two twenty five back. All three of those guys think that they're going to win this race and have no intention of working for the other. <laughs> it's just going to get wow. What wild. it's amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Spencer, it's no secret. I absolutely love your newsletter. If you're listening to this and you don't subscribe, you should be a paying subscriber of Spencer's newsletter. I think it's the best content in professional cycling. One of the things that I've really enjoyed during the Vuelta, I always like when you've got the screenshot and the arrows of who is where, but specifically you've had a couple of, of just how radically out of position UAE is. <laughs> they're never, they're never yeah. in a good position. Oh, it's, it's just hilarious. If you haven't seen those, uh, those issues in the newsletter, you got to go check them out. But so many times, Yumbo is in exactly right, the right position. You know, you talked a moment ago about how Quick Step did the roadblock move the other day. And I mean, it just made me, I was like, is this, UHC at a crit in 1998 to Gord Fraser, like calling this move, like, you they know, Gord are they going to yeah, go wide to the inside apex of the turn? Um, but yeah, I just don't, I just don't see quick step riding with a level of, uh, of strategic news that, that would be indicative of their ability to really command the lead in this race and hold on to it. And then looking at UAE, they're just never in the right position ever. And they're just, you're right. It's every person for themselves. No, it's, it's like if you're, well, by the way, with Ghana, it, it kind of reminds me of someone who's like in cat five, but doesn't really know how to race, but it's ready f- time for him to cat up. It's like, okay. He's that, mountain, he's that mountain bike pro that showed up at your local crit yeah. and is riding in the cat five race. And, and then yeah, UAE reminds me of like, you're on a team. Uh, it's like maybe you're a cat three, you show up and you just meet each other right before the race. That's kind of how they race. So it's like, oh, talk about, talk about the lead out. Like who's yeah. going to do the lead? It just never works. Like that's, <laughs> that's the level they're at. Before yeah. you have to go. Yeah. You predicted, I think on this podcast, I think you did. You said Rimco was going to Ineos. I didn't really believe it. I thought that was all smoke. Um, Johan Bernil, the host of the co-host of my other podcast, is is pushing back on this, kind of uh got me on the train of believing this, and then now is pushing back on this. So I, I should say that as a disclaimer, but I kind of think this is happening. I, I looked at, you look at Ineos next year, 15 riders under contract. That's that's half of a team. And then the word now is that they're just going to buy Quick Step because that's the easiest way to get Remco's contract. Right. J- just buy the team. Now you own Remco. Smash the teams together. Boom. Problem solved. And you get the benefit of the fact that Quick Step has sponsors in place. So Enios would be saving money on the deal because they would get the sponsorship contracts that Quick Step has. You get two years of someone else paying for your team. I think this is happening, Andrew. I, I didn't believe it. Now I think Remco is on a combined Ineos quick stack next year. And that would kind of explain some of the weird, I would say aggressive behavior from Remco toward this team. I, as I said earlier, I've never seen yeah. a rider just straight up blame their team car for not giving them information, which I guarantee you they gave them that they were racing for the win. Yeah. And would that, do we then think that is- Israel Premier Tech would get that remaining world tour license if those two teams are combined? Is that how it would, it would shake out from a points they point could, of view? Because if Jim Ratcliffe, the owner of Ineos, buys Quick Step, then he has two licenses. Right. These things are usually worthless, but in this specific scenario, you probably, yeah, he could sell it to Israel. They're in the world tour. Just the one slight hitch there is would Israel want to be in the world tour or do they like their current position like they're not at this Vuelta. i'd be curious to know if they want to be at this Vuelta, or is that kind of nice for them to get to pick and choose their races the only thing is you have to perform well every year to keep right. getting invites to these uh big races well i'm if we think back to the points relegation battle last year i believe the owner of israel premier tech was threatening some massive litigation to try to get them into the world tour so if so, you had the yeah. chance yeah, right, just to to buy his way in, I think he would do that. Probably, it probably we could like be very we'll check money. into that. You probably, yeah, I, I don't know, million million euros, maybe. You know, usually these things sell for a dollar, so it, it would be rare for them to sell that much. But if you're Ratcliffe and you got an extra world tour license floating around, and there's someone with enough money 
to fund a world. Because I think we could buy a world tour license. What are we going to do with it? We probably don't have the money to put together a team, but Sylvan Adams does. So it's kind of I a don't perfect know. buyer. I don't know. If we put together an investment cartel, got an account on AngelList, and maybe put a tin can out down at the Scratch Cafe, I think we pretty the quickly tin, could yeah. have... The, could have the capital we need from might the Boulder a community. Few yeah. flights to Riyadh, perhaps. Um, yeah, might need a bit of Gulf Bridge funding <laughs> there. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Andrew. And I, I mean, I'm excited that this is really fun. Out this is playing out. I'm excited to see. And I try not to talk about Sepku so much because I do think he's a really good guy and a good writer. Yeah, absolutely. And, He's, he's a CU guy. I mean, that, that's the crazy thing about this. He's not like a development kid. He just kind of grew up in Durango. What is going on with Durango producing so many top level cyclists? That's wild. But just kind of riding mountain bikes around Durango was racing road on this CU team, collegiate team, which no, no pros ever come out of collegiate cycling, was on this team called Harley Davidson Gateway, which is like an amateur team based out of St. Louis wins the queen stage at redlands which is a like a local u.s race and then gets signed to rally it, it's really an incredible rise and he's not one of these bubble kids that was like picked by usa cycling from day one to right. be a great rider so it's amazing that he's found his way from collegiate cycling to leading the wealth of España. yeah just really good at what he does and has worked his ass off yeah and there's probably something to be said for kind of an or organically developing skills. Like I think his bike handling skills are just better than the average yeah. American because he was mountain biking so much growing up and not so focused on road racing from a young age. Similar to Rambo. It's very similar. Yes. Almost identical. But we'll let you go, Andrew, and we'll try to get back on next week after these big weekend mountain stages. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.